everyone, and welcome to this next session, during which we're going to be focusing on interregional trade flows and South-South cooperation. It's a live session, so please do use the Q&A function to send through your questions, and we're going to get through as many of them as we possibly can. Um, for those of you who I've not had the chance to meet yet, my name is Shannon Manders, and I'm GTR's Editorial Director. And I'm delighted to introduce you to this superb lineup of speakers for this session. So I'll just run through that really quickly. Um, so we're joined today by um, Carl Chirwa, who's head of international banking at Bank One. We're also joined by um, Barnabas Kalenzi, who's head of business intelligence at Bank of Kikali. Um, also joining us is Stuart Mapalo Mumba, who's the country manager trade finance and working capital at Atlas Mara Zambia. And finally, Parikh Talsidas, who's the senior executive, treasury and markets at Afroasia Bank. Welcome gentlemen from across the continent this morning. It's great to have you with us today. Um, now let's get, let's get straight. Sorry for those technical difficulties, but thanks for sticking with us. So I think um, where I dropped off was getting straight to it. Um, so we've been talking about intra-Africa trade for so many years now, I feel. Um, we know that intra-Africa trade rose to 16% in 2018 um, from 5% in 1980, but it remains low compared to inter-regional trade across regions such as Europe and Asia. Um, and it may just be one of the continent's best options for a post-pandemic recovery. But what's new in the conversation? Like, from from where you guys are all sitting in each of your in each of your countries, how? And we're back. <laughs> uh, so um, where I was was just asking you guys what's new in the conversation when it comes to interregional trade. And, and maybe Carl, I'll start with you if that's okay. Thanks, Shannon. I think um, before we get into what's new, we need to understand the concept and uh, why it's taken us so long to actually get to this point of intra-Africa trade. If you look at the history of Africa and the hard history and the dark history of colonialism, Africa was never set up to trade for itself, right? It was always set up to export raw materials and commodities to the rest of the world. And that's the economic construct has been there for centuries. So that's gonna be very hard to push back and to try to, to roll back. But I believe that there is now political will, which was never there before, uh, for, it, for Africa to start trading within itself, within its borders. Uh, typically, if you look at, uh, from the US to China and, and Europe. All the trade was to build rail into the inlands, into the upcountry, and just produce farm goods and minerals and commodities for export to the, to the rest of the world. Uh, and there was no value addition, right? For example, uh, Stuart sits in uh, Zambia where they produce probably some of the world's uh, greatest copper. But which country in Africa can just buy copper in its raw form? 
right? We, we have no use for it. But unless they, they, they add value to it and we can now start to buy it as you know, an added value commodity, then we can start trading. Otherwise, as in the raw commodities in themselves, we have no use for them in Africa. Uh, if you look at across the border from Stuart and the GRC, they produce coltan and cobalt. That's probably the biggest, uh, most valuable material for uh, making cell phones, right? If we could be making cell phones within Africa, then there's a reason why that, that cobalt and coltan could be converted to cell phones and we can trade cell phones instead of buying um, Apple products from um, the US. Because if you look at it, even if we're saying um, inter-Africa trade has grown by 16%, it only accounts for less than 1% of global value in terms of world trade value. That's how much we're getting back from what we're exporting. But if we're able to add value to that, like I said, Apple phones never decrease in price, right? They've just released the latest iPhone 12. I'm sure it's much more than the iPhone 11, but the price of cobalt is subject to the people who buy it. Uh, so my view is if we can start adding value to our products uh, to a point where our neighboring countries can actually use those products, then you'll see a boost in Indian Africa trade. But as long as we're exporting raw commodities and raw agricultural produce, we have no use for it uh, across the borders. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else has got a different view. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely keen to hear from somebody else. Barnabas, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, we, we understand it's a historical issue. Uh, thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Carl. That was well put. I think a lot of uh, work has been put uh, into diversification of our economies. I think uh, if you look at a country like uh, Mauritius, which came from being sugar-based economy to focusing on our financial services, as is evidenced by the number of representatives on, on this panel. Uh, we've had uh, Botswana focusing on diamonds. We see Ethiopia going into manufacturing. And Rwanda, where I'm sitting, is uh, trying to become an ICT and uh, innovation hub. So those kind of diversifications can allow us to, to trade with each other while also adding value to the natural resources that we are fond of uh, trading in. You see several countries, again, I'll use Rwanda where I am as an example, investing in a gold refinery. And uh, this is what helped uh, Rwanda during the COVID period. Most exports uh, increased due to exports of gold, refined gold. And this was also helped by the fact that the price of gold was going up, whereas the traditional commodity prices were going down like the, the tea and coffee. So I think diversification is very key uh, for us to really nip this in the bud and increase the intra-African trade to the 25% that we are targeting uh, by 2025. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Barnabas. Um, Parikh, let's hear from, from you and your perspective. Hi, Shannon. Thanks. And uh, hi to all the delegates as well. Look, I think uh, it's, uh, it's not an easy question to answer in the sense that there are lots of variables, right? Uh, now, I think personally that it's something that starts from the top. I think you need political will to make things happen uh, because, you know, uh, if at a senior level or at a government level, there isn't the buy-in and the willingness to actually start trading uh, amongst the countries, I don't think we can go very far. Now, it's true that, you know, uh, African countries have been colonized by various countries in Europe. And what's happened over the years is that they've ensured that whatever minerals and commodities that are found in those countries are actually pushed up to uh, the countries that, you know, uh, were colonizing uh, these respective countries in Africa for their own economic development. Now, what happens is that when you go back into history, countries that have actually been very successful have actually moved from uh, agriculture to manufacturing. Now, in Africa, we haven't really moved towards uh, manufacturing. I mean, have we really got uh, the agricultural, uh, agricultural uh, economy right? Probably not yet, because there's so much land, so much more can be done. But we haven't really got that, if you want, that political will yet to make things happen and make things happen fast. Now, 
we tend to, in Africa, when we need expertise, we go beyond the continent, right? We go to Europe, to the US, to Asia to get expertise. But actually, we should start even looking at intra-Africa, whether there are countries that have done specific things properly, right? Uh, I think there's a lot of good things that have been done. For example, you know, I mean, we're talking of the COVID situation, the pandemic. As a result of the pandemic, it's actually been a wake-up call in places like East Africa. They are today self-sufficient in terms of PPE equipment. Uh, so there's a lot of things that can be done. There's a lot of uh, industries that have had to reinvent themselves. And for example, in Mauritius itself, you've got textiles companies, textiles manufacturing companies that have had to move away from manufacturing jeans or uh, you know any other types of textiles to manufacturing masks for the local uh, economy, but also to sell to the regional economy. So there's a lot of things that can happen. And I think the willingness has to start at the highest level to say that, okay, we can share ideas, we can share expertise, okay? And you know who else than Africans will understand Africa? I think this is something that we need to sort of now embed in the minds of everyone is that it can be done within the continent. These, these are some of my thoughts, really. Yeah. Thanks, Parikh. And we're going to come to these opportunities that we've seen on the back of the pandemic, and we're going to come to that political will, um, which I think is a massive talking point, which is obviously the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. But let me let me come to Stuart for his opening thoughts in terms of what's new in the conversation with regards to intra-regional trade. Uh, well, um, uh, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks, Shana. Well, um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll sort of uh, start it this way. Um, the conversation has been going on for a very long time. Uh, if you look at what gave birth to the likes of, you know, the regional uh, settings such as Comesa, the ESC, uh, ECOWAS, uh, the intention was to obviously promote that activity within the, the continent. So um, the only failure was that uh, there hasn't been, we haven't been, been able to walk the talk, that's the thing. But uh, I think with the, with the, with the uh, Free Controller Trade Area Initiative, I think there's a bit more uh, intent. And uh, being an unabashed optimist, I think that uh, we we'll definitely realize that activity in, in terms of being able to trade amongst ourselves. And I think it's, it's very important, uh, especially in view of uh, what Carl mentioned um, around the historical issues, right? And the sort of mindsets that, that those issues pr produced around uh, being um, a producer but not being able to, to add value, right? So with this uh, initiative, um, from where I'm sitting, I'm seeing a, 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 lot, a lot more political will and intention to be able to get this uh, across the line. And then also, um, uh, I think the key issue in terms of being able for us to actually realize that dream is um, things around um, um, it, the way we trade amongst ourselves, right? So for instance, um, you know, um, the hegemony of uh, usage of the, the US dollar, you know what I mean, right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a very uncomfortable conversation, but I think it's one that we need to have. Um, for instance, uh, if I'm buying um, product out of Zimbabwe or Botswana or DRC or out of Rwanda, or out of Tanzania or Malawi, right? Why can't uh, uh, I use kwacha to kwacha, Malawi kwacha and Zambian kwacha. You know what I mean, right? So um, I think that's the one of the issues that has to be addressed. What what if we were brave enough to say, can we use the Nigerian naira as the as a continental currency cutting across the entire continent, or the South African rand, right? So I think those are the things that uh, I think we need to to be able to address, uh, and I think uh, sooner uh, rather than later, uh, in my opinion. Uh, for us to be able to realize that dream, because obviously the the the, the role of currency, financial institutions, is something that we cannot exclude from the conversation. So we need to be able to get that aspect of the 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 whole initiative right. Otherwise, it will be another one of those things that we talk about, and you know, remains just on paper. So that's th th those are my thoughts. Yeah. Thank you, Stuart. Um, so let's turn our attention then to the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Um, it's been probably the biggest talking point on the continent over the course of the last couple of years. But what does it mean practically? Um, Carl, I'm going to come to you first of all. Like, how, why, why is political will so important? 
Yeah, I think uh, to just tag on to what Stuart and everybody else said, political will is the one thing that drives things. And I've seen, uh, I think, under the leadership of Barnes versus President uh, Kagame, the, this conversation has actually moved forward in a way that I didn't expect. In the last two years, agreements have been signed and uh, countries have signed up and executed the instruments in a pace which I was actually quite pleasantly surprised. Obviously, we still have uh, you know, elephants in the room with other countries still trying to look to protect their domestic economies. And uh, some political leaders not looking beyond their five-year terms or four-year terms of presidency. But I think a lot of other leaders are now looking at we are stronger together. We can actually um, face the world and demand a place on the table. Uh, particularly, I think, touching on to what you said during the, the, the pandemic uh, and, and, and Tariq as well. The AU was actually able to go and negotiate a package with China in terms of how we import our own PPE. If each and every country had gone individually to, to place orders for PPE, they would not have gotten the best rates. They would probably not have got the best attention because the orders would have been small. But it, I think the AU brought together um, everybody and said, we're going to do this as a package deal. And that way it shows strength in numbers. And I believe when um, the political will is that it's about us rather than about me, uh, that conversation starts to move forward a lot more. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty excited. I mean, I know this, it's not gonna be easy uh, because it's about letting, opening up your economies. We know the situation in South Africa with xenophobia. It's, you know, it's, it's real. It's not something that you can wash away. Uh, we know the situation in um, Nigeria in terms of trying to close the economy uh, and, and protect protected from, you know, uh, dumping from, you know, from neighbors. But I believe that if you look past that over the fast, the next five years, you actually tend to benefit more rather than what you would if you were to go it alone. So that's where I think the conversation should be. And I believe a new crop of African leaders is having that conversation and having it seriously. Mm, thanks, Carl. Anybody else want to chime in on the free trade agreement and what that yeah. means? Yeah, go ahead, Parik. Look, uh, I was reading about it, and uh, as we all know, there's like there's a lot of uh, regional economic communities that have been set up, and a lot of them are intertwined with the various countries, part of different types of you know re uh, RECs. Uh, the issue is that uh, you know then what you you don't really have focus in terms of what you want to achieve and how you want to achieve it. Now the thing is. The African continental uh, free trade area, I think that's something very exciting. Uh, the issue that we have today is that I think the pandemic uh, hasn't really helped. So that has been pushed back a little bit to probably next year. But I think it's, it's very exciting that, you know, we want to have uh, a lot more trade, movement of people, goods, etc. Uh, across the continent. I mean, but I think there are also a number of things that need to change for that to, to be able to happen. And only looking at tariffs will not help. I think there's a lot of non-tariff barriers that need to be you know, uh, put away uh, uh, in the sense that, for example, you look at infrastructure, you look at uh, the problem of air travel. You know, It's sometimes uh, cheaper to travel intercontinent than intracontinent. So all of that needs to be looked at. And I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's something that will take time but I think there needs to be clear focus with timelines as to how these are achieved. And when I look at, you know, how many countries have already signed up, I think there's 30 countries out of the 54 that have ratified it already. I think that's encouraging, but it's important to get all of the countries involved uh, and then to learn from, you know, what the neighbors or the other countries are doing well and to adapt that in, into the specific countries. So I think it's, it's, it's very exciting but we shouldn't let the same things happen to what's happened to some of the other uh, RECs that we know. Uh, the encouraging thing yesterday I read about that is that Comesa wants to start a regional payment system. I think that is, that is very good. But just going back to Stuart's point earlier in terms of the US dollar, I, I know that is, you know, it, it's, it's a very good thing to have. It's a very good thing to do to have a common uh, currency that can be used for trade across the continent. But I think it's going to take time, a lot of time, because, you know, whether you like it or not, I mean, the US dollar is the currency of the world and all commodities are linked to a price in US dollars. So it's going to take time. But there are, there are ways of getting over it in terms of how do you 
manage liquidity where you have excess liquidity in certain areas, uh, whereas others need liquidity to, to, to carry out trade. And this is where you can leverage off uh, the expertise or you know, the liquidity pool that you have, for example, in places like Mauritius uh, or South Africa, and, and really to help develop that trade finance business across the continent. Yeah. Thanks, Parikh. I actually have a question from the audience um, related to what you and what Stuart were talking about with regards to currency. Um, so if I can interject here and ask that question now, and then maybe either of you would be happy to take it. So the question is, um, what stops us as Africans from agreeing on a common currency to facilitate trade? Big question. Um, Tarek? Stuart? Thanks. Well, I think that uh, we, uh, we are sort of uh, delving into a, a rather uncomfortable space. Uh, because of us, you know, obviously, you know, uh, the, the whole ge geopolitical setup, uh, you know, the USD being the currency of the world has enabled the USA to be where it is today, you know what I mean, right? And obviously that also uh, is evident in the way that sort of the USA is able to bully everybody, you know. So from that perspective, um, and I sort of, as much as it's, 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 a, it's a hope for me, uh, we also have to operate from, from, from reality, right? So what, what, what Parikh mentioned around timing, when we can get to a point where we have a single currency, uh, I don't think it's something that's probably gonna happen maybe in the next 20, 30 years. It's gonna take a bit of time, uh, but also it's one of those issues that um, as a continent, as a start, and, and I think settling back to the conversation around the SCFTA, um, when we clapped, when we get together, uh, um, strength in numbers, as Carl mentioned, it gives us uh, a stronger voice and a stronger footing to then push back to the world and say, why should we clear in US dollars or euros or GBP, right? Why can we use, like I mentioned, uh, go to would be the, 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 the Nigeria Naira or the South African Rand, in my opinion, um, for obviously a reason, obviously th those are the uh, largest economies uh, obviously on, on, on the continent. So um, it's really around us uh, sort of speaking with a unified voice. That's what might be able to get us to a point where we can use a single currency. But also, um, the very nature of Africa, you know, is uniqueness. Um, I mean, you have 54 states. And even just in terms of the diversity of, the, of, of, of you know, the ethnicity, um, even the geography itself, uh, those, are, those are issues, first of all, that are, that are to be addressed for us to get to a point where we, we can then have a conversation around um, having single currency and sort of a unified um, economy. But I think um, I'm really excited about the SCFT and, and, and in my opinion, it's, uh, I think it's, 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 it's a greater step that the continent has taken since the 60s. And obviously the 60s, you know, we had a wave of independence. Um, so I think since then, uh, the, 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 free, the, the contract trade agreement, in my opinion, I think is one of the landmark uh, uh, issues that obviously I've, I've emerged uh, across the continent. I'm really excited about that. But obviously um, issues around currency uh, is not something that might happen tomorrow, but definitely might happen in the future. So that's, um, those are my thoughts. Uh, I don't know, yeah. Eric might have a different- Maybe, maybe, I, maybe I can interject there. Uh, sorry, b before Perry comes in. I believe, okay, single currency might be a bit complicated for everybody to follow one line. Uh, but I think in, in our individual states, like I said earlier, if we can add value to, to produce products which our neighbors would want, right? Right now, for example, I'm from Malawi, you're from Zambia. What is it in Zambia that Malawi can use? We can't use copper, right? So we, we don't eat it, right? Um, maize. We, we, maize. Eat maize. Maize. Yeah. we eat maize, yeah. So, and we grow rice. Why don't you buy our rice in Malawi kwacha and you buy, we buy your maize in Zambia kwacha and we net the difference, you know? With those little micro adjustments, rather than, than trying to get everything perfect, I had a boss who used to tell me that don't let perfect be the enemy of good, right? And that always stuck with me. If you can start with something good, maybe on one particular commodity, we, we trade you $100 million worth of rice in kwacha against, uh, you know, uh, your, your, your maize exports. That's something that you can do net off, but it requires political will, like you said. That's good, Carl. So, so, so sorry to sort of interrupt. So um, are you sort of suggesting that uh, we, we sort of ex explore the barter system uh, where there's no cash flow involved? Because 
No, it could be um, cash, but what happens is you, you could have East Central Bank having a Nostra account of um, uh, the other currency for their, for their neighboring countries. So that whatever exports, you know, the thing is all our people are, are so obsessed with exporting in order to get dollars. Why don't you just export to get export revenue, right? Export revenue can come in different forms. So I can have export revenue in my account of 10 million kwacha because I'm going to use that to buy something from Zambia, right? Which I can still sell in the domestic market. What is happening now is I'm going to have to pay you in the US, in New York, for a product that is coming from across the border, which at the moment is absurd, right? The border between Malawi and Zambia is probably two hours at Chipata, right? And, and, and between Chipata and, uh, and, and um, probably, I'll say Livingston and, uh, and, and Zimbabwe is maybe six hours. But if you have to send the money to New York, it's 24 hours before you get paid. Well, Carl, you you've know? touched on the subject that I want to add on, the issue of Nostra accounts. I think depending so much on uh, SWIFT uh, and correspondent banks is also leading to contributing to this dependency on dollars. Uh, certain investments have been done in terms of payment platforms. I think East Africa has EAPS, which hasn't really peaked because of the political goodwill lacking. Uh, you'll also see that a lot of the West African countries uh, use a similar currency, but the period to develop uh, a payment platform that suits them and enables them to transact has delayed. But I think this year we are going to see the blueprint finally coming to, to fruition. You'll also see what Kenya has done in terms of uh, M-Pesa and uh, the East African region picking up uh, mobile money payments. And you see right now you can make real-time payments from Rwanda to Kenya to Uganda using your phone. So why can't we do the same when it comes to, to, to trade? So I think there's a lot of inroads that have been made. There's a lot of mentality shifting that needs to change. And like you said before, it has to come from the top to everyone. Everyone needs to meet and speak the same language. Yeah, Absolutely, so and 90% and, and, and of our account. trade is informal anyway, right? So these people can actually use their phones to trade because what's captured in the system and in the economic data is the formal trade, which is in Africa, you're only scratching the surface. It's the women who call, go to the border and buy the stuff at the border and cross over with it. Those are the people who actually make intra-Africa trade possible. Yeah, so Sorry, sort of, if I, so just to okay, sort of ahead, respond to, uh, sort of, uh, I thought just crossed my mind uh, in light of uh, what Barnabas has shared. So um, are we saying we have um, a massive opportunity uh, in front of us purely on account of the fact that we can leave uh, technology to sort of speed up things that maybe the rest of the world um, took sort of maybe quarter, quarter of a century to sort of reach? Uh, absolutely. Uh, is, are, are we not sort of milking that opportunity for its worth? Are we? Absolutely. I, I believe that the, the fintech that's able to get into that space and have a multi currency payment system over a mobile platform, that will be the next Alibaba or the next uh, Alipay, you know, for Africa. Because we need to develop solutions which are relevant for Africa, which can be used by the African at a cost price that is accessible. Uh, if I can just add something there, I think that's a very, very important point because we all bankers here, right? And uh, we understand how difficult regulations are, how difficult it would be to harmonize all the regulations if we were to have commonality, uh, you know, in terms of payment uh, payments or even usage of a common currency across the continent. So I think technology plays a very important part there, which could potentially then sort of, uh, you know, not, I, I won't say bypass, but not having to go through all that trouble of harmonization, etc. Uh, from like leapfrog. Leapfrog, leap yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the right word. So I, I think that's going to be extremely important. And I, I was just thinking about this. You know, as as the the financial sector in the in the region grows as well, why not you know have banks that have branches that can have branches in in other countries in Africa. You know, instead of having to go for a subsidiary, why can't, you know, banks that are based, let's say, in Mauritius or South Africa have a branch in Nairobi or have a branch in, in Livingston or whatever? I think this is something that could eventually come, 
as we move forward. Uh, and and you and banks will play an extremely important role in terms of trade finance in the region as well. I'm gonna yeah. interject here for a second. Thank you very much. And just uh, I just want to progress the conversation a little bit. Um, this has actually come in on one of the audience Q and A's as well. There are so many questions, so we'll try and get to them as as many of them as we can. The question is, are we seeing greater collaboration across African banks now? And to what extent is the Continental Free Trade Agreement actually going to increase that? It's a, it's a good question. Um, maybe I'll put it over to you first, Carl. Sure, I think that's a fantastic question because I'm smiling because we've just done something similar uh, with a couple of banks on this panel. Um, I'll give you the backdrop. Malawi is an agricultural country, still, you know, are exporting raw commodities, like I said at the beginning, and they export tobacco as a primary crop. And they have six months where they are cash rich in terms of tobacco, uh, dollars when they're exporting. And the other six months, they're really um, struggling with forex and, and forex availability in the market. So what we did in Mauritius, because we have access to uh, relatively cheap dollars compared to the rest of the continent, we came up with a structure where we invited continental banks, including Bonus's bank, uh, Bank of Kigali, and I believe Parik and, and his bank is also involved. And we've got banks out of um, uh, Mauritius, as well as uh, the UK uh, and Nairobi, actually coming to support a $100 million club deal, where we actually do a swap for the Central Bank of Malawi to allow them that six months to bridge the gap of Forex availability. Um, and this is, I think, a fantastic testament to that. You've got African banks who understand an African, uniquely African problem and come up with a solution to another African uh, uh, country. And it's working very well. The government of Malawi is very happy. The central bank is very happy. Uh, the banks are also well covered and it's uh, wrapped up with um, a credit insurance from an African insurer called uh, African Trade Insurance. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard of them. And this gives comfort to other lenders that you're being uh, rated, uh, wrapped with an um, investment grade rate wrapping uh, for otherwise a very difficult credit to do. Uh, because Malawi as a, a sovereign is not rated and the central bank is not rated. But so in normal circumstances, you couldn't do the deal. But the fact that you've got African countries and African bankers who understand the situation and understand the risks and able to box the risk, um, you've got five countries involved coming to help one African country. So that, that collaboration is happening and we're no longer having to wait for the World Bank or the IMF to come up with these solutions. So these are actually being generated in-house and we're all very proud of that. Uh, to add on to what um, Carl has mentioned, I think we're also seeing certain uh, African or regional banks acting as finance intermediaries in the trade finance process. We'll see the likes of Afrexim, TDB, uh, MCB, and some of the Mauritian banks opening uh, trade lines with the local African banks. So banks can open LCs, can and they get confirmed quickly. These uh, banks are also building relationships with the, some of the multinational companies that are being approached to import products, especially oil products. And it's been a seamless experience. So the more we do it, the more experience we get, the more information we share, especially if I know that Carl's bank can sort uh, out my bank in a certain area and we, we can approach and communicate and build relationships. I think that's key. So we've started uh, and it's going to continue growing, especially in the relationship uh, building aspect. Yeah, I guess that's a key follow-up question uh, maybe to you, Carl, because this is one, this is maybe one transaction, but how do you, how do you scale that? Like, um, you know, moving away from a working on a transaction to transaction basis to working on a sort of more sort of macro scale and, and enhancing that relationship for the long term. Yeah, absolutely. I think, Shannon, this is where uh, forums like GTR Africa actually, uh, I think, add a lot of value. Uh, I think there's a saying in business which says that people do business with people that they know and people that they like, right? So now I know all the people in this panel. I know Parikh, I know Stuart, I know Barnabas. It's easy for me to pick up the call and say, hey, guys, there's this deal. Do you guys want to be part of it? Because they've got a track record with me. They trust, they build trust. You know, you can be able to scale this into Zambia if the government of Zambia needs the same thing. Actually, Barnabas will tell you we've done the exact same thing for the central bank in Rwanda and it's working fantastically well. 
And I believe that uh, as the more we interact in these forums, you build these networks, you build these relationships, you're able to scale this. So it's not a hobby and it's not a once-off, it becomes a program. But it's not an IMF program or a World Bank program. It's purely commercially driven by commercial bankers who have been raised on the continent. Thanks, Carl. Stuart, um, you're, you're nodding in agreement. Do you have something to add there? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, um, I, I, I totally agree with uh, Carl and, and Barnabas in terms of the fact that there's been um, some significant improvement in terms of from a collaboration perspective. Um, and it's very encouraging. Uh, obviously, uh, Barnabas did mention the likes of TDB, Affectum, and obviously even the FDB themselves, despite the issues around speed, speed to execution. Um, and obviously most of the, the FIs out of Mauritius, I think the VD really uh, uh, take, taking the lead in, in improving that uh, collaboration. But I, I also just want to challenge my colleagues, uh, Parikh and, and Carl, to say, I think we need a bit more bravery from you guys, especially uh, because this is close to home, right? Um, we all know the, the noise around Zambia's, uh, you know, the optics around Zambia's, you know, the macros and everything, right? But it's a good story. And, and, and I think you guys um, sort of as, as a, a trailblazer in terms of, you know, providing that level of, you know, support, I think a bit more bravery would be welcome, honestly, uh, to venture into areas where the likes of maybe, um, let, me, let me not mention brand names yet, the, the, the European banks and the American banks wouldn't venture into, right? So uh, I think that's, 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 that's the only ask. Otherwise, uh, the collaboration has improved, but we need a bit more bravery from uh, uh, Mauritius. Sure, actually, Stuart, I'll, I'll throw it back to you because the way I view it is, you know, um, there's nothing that substitutes, local, that substitutes local knowledge, right? So we would rely on you uh, on the ground to be able to decode some of the risk. And, and, and you know, bring the facts to light and go beyond the headlines that we see and you know, tell the real story. Once everybody's comfortable around the story, I'm sure there's enough brilliant minds around the table to come up with the structure. And you're right, I think Mauritian banks are really eyeing that space where most of these global correspondent banks are actually de-risking or, or scaling back their operations in Africa. Some of them are very left. Some of them are not seeing it as a profitable venture anymore. It's a marginal, uh, I would say they, they say it's, it's, it's a rounding error on their balance sheet right? But for us, it's huge revenue opportunity, right? So we can actually come in because we're from Africa and we're off Africa. And I think Parik will tell you this. I think the, the mentality in Mauritius is we're onshore and offshore Africa. So it gives us that little leverage and advantage that we're the last investment grade country left in Africa. So we still attract, you know, quite significant liquidity and cheaper liquidity. But the fact that we know the market and we're comfortable and we've got people like you on the ground that we can pick up the call and say, hey, I read this, is this true? Or give me more color around this, you know? That way I, do, I go beyond the headlines and actually form an opinion which is educated. That, yeah. and it's all about the quality of, quality of information that you get to make a decision. So that's where we rely on you guys as well. So that's why the partnership is, is actually important. It's not a one-way street. Yeah, no, that's- And it's uh, such an important- Over to you, Parry. No, no, I'm just uh, adding on a little bit. I think Carl has said uh, most of it. Uh, I think it's about awareness as well. Uh, it's important uh, that, you know, the continent understands what is Mauritius all about. I think over the years we've built uh, what we call here the global business sector. So we have a lot of uh, foreign currency liquidity. And what we've done over the last few years is trying to be a sort of the lender to banks, right? Uh, because we don't have access directly to the local markets. So we can't go directly to a corporate, let's say, in Zambia or Malawi or Kenya or whatever. So what we do is we work a lot more with the banks and we lend them money so that they can do a better form of trade finance uh, lending or even corporate lending on their side and hopefully cheaper as well because we sit with a lot of uh, you know excess liquidity on the island. I think it's the same story for, for Carl and for some of the other banks. I mean, we've got a clear Africa strategy and this is what we want to do more and more going forward. So it's important to create that awareness as well so that you know exactly, uh, as we mentioned earlier, we need to know what the different economies and the different countries are good at doing and then leverage on their strengths. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, I was gonna ask the question, Parikh, um, 
you know, you, you've, so you've been challenged, but how important is access to data then and access to, you know, the, these, these, these relationships that you have with banks? How important is data to um, accessing that, that knowledge um, of, of other um, institutions on, on the continent? It's extremely important. I think Carl touched on that a little bit earlier as well, is that, look, we don't necessarily have on the ground uh, knowledge in terms of having people on the ground, right? So it's important that there's a lot of information sharing that happens. Previously, before the uh, COVID situation, we used to travel uh, very often to the countries where we wanted to, to do business and where we had- The, the know, good old days. Banks. The good old days, exactly. Uh, but now that it's changing, I mean, one thing I've noticed is that these Zoom calls actually work extremely well. And it's more focused because when you go to the countries, you have to worry about traffic and moving from one area to the other for meetings. And you don't, you don't really have a lot of time to discuss about all the nitty gritties of you know, what's happening in the, the economy or in specific names. So uh, these Zoom calls are actually extremely interesting where you get to you know, spend 45 minutes to an hour, discuss about specific files, discuss, discuss about specific issues in the economy and understand the, the whole thing much better. And I think it's not only the banks, it's important also, one thing that we used to do is ensure that we meet the central banks and even audit firms uh, all the time, you know, when we go into a specific country for a roadshow, because that gives you a different perspective uh, to, to what's happening from a banking or bank-related, uh, you know, uh, perspective into a specific agenda. So, yeah. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, you're right. The, the Zoom calls do work well if you have um, good internet speeds, which we don't seem to have here in England. They seem to be better today in places like Zambia and Mauritius. But anyway, I want to, I want to just move on very briefly. We've got stacks of um, questions coming through from the audience, and we've just got a few minutes left. Now, we build this session as to talk about interregional trade, but also to talk about South-South cooperation. So maybe let's spend a couple of minutes talking about South-South cooperation linked to this one question, which is, we hear a lot of talk about South-South flows with um, the example of China dominating, um, but to what extent is there African bank engagement with local banks from other emerging markets? And where are the other hotspots? Who, who would like to take on that question? Nobody's switching on there. Sure. There we go, Carl. Sure. I think uh, to be honest with you, African banks are more focused on trying to build relations within Africa at the moment. Um, and like I say, trying to take that space where the large global correspondent banks are actually leaving and think that's a space to play. Um, in terms of forming relationships with other regions, I think that's a dominant uh, position of the correspondent banks. It's very hard for me to go directly to China and, and start a relationship with a bank in China or in, in India or in New Zealand, right? That's where I think those guys play well. We should play well in our space and we should play to win in our space. And I don't think that's a space we're ever gonna win because the infrastructure required and the data analytics behind that that's required, we don't have the investment to do that yet. So why don't we focus on what we can do and what we do best, which is to build the relationship within the African banks. And I think GTR 2020 is one of those uh, platforms. It's not the only one, but I think it's a key piece where we as bankers can actually come in, start to know each other, start to like each other, and then we do business with each other. Thanks, Carl. Uh, Perry, want to add? Yeah, I just want to add something there. I mean, interestingly, we've uh, recently done something in terms of China-Africa trade, where we have actually uh, confirmed uh, LCs that were opened by Chinese banks uh, into Africa, actually. So that was interesting. But then also we've seen instances recently where, you know, we're helping corporates, for example, in terms of procurement from, uh, you know, let's, uh, I, I think it was fuel from uh, Mozambique to Zimbabwe. So finance that uh, the logistics around it. So there's a lot of more now I feel coming into uh, intracontinent. So we see a lot of trade that starting to happen uh, between the countries as well. And again, you know, uh, this is where Mauritius plays an interesting role in terms of you know, the ability to finance uh, with the excess liquidity that we have. Uh, so again, I come back to the same thing, which is awareness. We need to build that awareness and it's important that we talk to other bankers 
uh, like we're doing now on this platform so that they understand when they have opportunities, they can think of us uh, going forward. All right, so we have just um, a couple of minutes left, uh, four minutes to be exact, which is, uh, I'm gonna ask one question and come to each of you for your answers on this question as a sort of wrap up. The one thing we didn't have a chance to really kind of get into today is, you know, we, the talk of the pandemic, um, but let's, let's, let's be optimistic and let's have a, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the opportunities that Africa might have on the back of the pandemic. So whether that's in terms of more opportunities for local manufacturing and production, um, more opportunities in terms of shifting supply chains, you know, we're hearing that people are overly realizing that they're overly reliant on China. What, what could Africa stand to gain from all of that? Um, so you've, I think we've just got about a minute each. Um, so I'll start with you, Carl. Sure, I think you touched on it. Uh, the disruption of supply chains is, uh, if Africa can actually leverage on that, it's a short window. You need to get your infrastructure right. You need to get your power right, to be able to be a low cost producer. So those are key priorities. If you can get them right, you snatch a large market share away from Africa, uh, from uh, China. But the second thing is the digital disruption as well. I think most people have had to digitize in two months what they should have done in two years, right? But Africa, I think, has already been on the digital front in terms of mobile money, mobile payments, deliveries, and things like that. So I think we were well positioned for that because we've had lots of mini lockdowns, you know, from disease and wars and strife. We, we've sort of dealt with this, and I think that's why we're dealing with the pandemic a lot better than most people expected. Thanks, Barnabas. Uh, like Carla said, we need to focus uh, a lot on leveraging uh, digital channels, ICT tools. Uh, E-commerce isn't being picked up uh, in the region, unfortunately, but it's something that we need to build a lot and also work on the logistics and transport channels that will help. We also need to exchange a lot of data to be able to know what my neighbor produces that have been buying from China and see how we can, we, can meet, uh, we can meet in the middle. So political goodwill to help us exchange data, exchange information so that we can trade really in a, in a cheap and successful manner. Thanks, Barnabas. Stuart. Well, I think that uh, the pandemic is a blessing in disguise, honestly. Uh, presents a huge opportunity for us to be able to consume our own uh, products. Um, and obviously, sort of just to, to uh, later it, what um, Carl said, um, uh, I, I, I think we can leverage uh, the speed of technology to be able to get, you know, um, uh, the data for us to also improve integrity of information that we exchange. Uh, because that's 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 really key. Uh, because obviously, without integrity, then it sort of uh, takes away the the, the trust element, uh, which is really key in the whole conversation. Uh, but also, um, I think it's important to acknowledge the the role of the likes of uh, Afrexim, TDB, and the FDB in terms of uh, how they've responded so uh, strongly, sort of support uh, the various uh, countries across the, the continent. Uh, in the middle of, uh, you know, the, the disruptions around the, the pandemic. But overall, um, I, I, I think one of the, uh, it's, it's one of those things that I think it's, 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 it's an opportunity that we can miss, especially if we don't move quickly. Um, it's, it's still there on the table and, and, and I think we need to move quicker. So yeah, uh, those are my thoughts. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Stuart. Um, over to you, Parikh. Yes. Uh, so I think the key word is focus. Uh, there has to be a clear understanding as to what do our neighbors need? What do we have to offer to them? Uh, and also uh, sharing of expertise. I think that's extremely important. There's a lot of expertise in the region. I think uh, when you look at, for example, the manufacturing sector here uh, in Mauritius, textiles manufacturing, I think it's thriving at the moment, uh, which is quite surprising because of China bashing. People don't want to import from China. So I'm um, hearing the people say, you know, we're doing extremely well now because people don't want to buy from China and the quality is good here. So we need to understand. I'm sure people, I'm sure the population in various countries in Africa also wear jeans and T-shirts and shirts, right? So we need to understand what do our neighbors require and how can we come in and, and make a difference for them and hopefully at a better price. So uh, sharing our expertise, focus is extremely important. We need to know exactly what we want to do for whom and what our neighbors need. Yeah. Excellent. 
Well, thank you, um, Barnabas, Carl, Parikh, Stuart. Um, I think you guys alone have progressed the conversation with regards to interregional trade. So I really appreciate um, the comments that you've made today. Um, thank you to our audience for getting involved, sending in your questions. And um, it's been a pleasure speaking to you all. And I hope to see you all again in person um, sometime very soon. Um, but in the meantime, take care. Goodbye.